Welcome back, everybody. It's Thursday, May 23rd, 2023. Now, born on this date in 1941, music composer and educator Jackson Hill of Birmingham. Today, let's talk about the latest state rankings, what you need to make to be middle class these days, and the DEI ban in effect. Then we'll share some clips from that child care virtual event with Senator Katie Britt and others. I'm Mike Morgan, and we're down in Alabama. U.S. News & World Report has released its annual ranking of the best states, reports AL.com's William Thornton. And boy, the formula doesn't think much of us. We ranked 44th. Mississippi, incidentally, ranked 48th. Now, other states I'll mention are Utah at number one, Louisiana at number 50, Florida, the highest southern state, at number nine, and North Dakota, if it truly exists, at number 15. Not a conspiracy guy, but I just haven't seen persuasive evidence yet. U.S. News & World Report said it considered thousands of data measurements on crime, health care, education, opportunity, natural environment, infrastructure, fiscal stability, and the economy. Health care and education were weighed the heaviest, and that's where we received two of our three lowest scores, 44 in health care and 45 in education. Now, on the better end of our scores, keeping us a few places above the Mississippi bar, was our 19th place ranking in fiscal stability of the state government. Now, speaking of fiscal stability, it's often said that the long-term fiscal stability of a state or nation depends on a healthy middle class. But what is the middle class? AL.com's Warren Kulo reports that the middle class income earners are not an exact overlap with people's perceptions of middle class folks. The Washington Post did a report and a survey this year asking people what it meant to them, and around 90% of U.S. adults agreed that being in the middle class means you have a secure job, the ability to actually save money, to afford an emergency $1,000 debt, to pay bills on time without much concern, to afford health insurance, and to retire comfortably. Now, that WAPO report also found that only a third of Americans met that definition of quote-unquote middle class. So let's stick to income. According to the latest numbers, to qualify as middle class in Alabama, you need a household income between $39,739 and $119,218. Now, if that U.S. News & World Report study we mentioned a while ago the one that ranked us the seventh worst state in the nation. If that has you currently packing your bags to leave, make sure you get a raise with that move because the national average household income to reach the middle class is about $28,000 higher than ours. Alabama's new law ban in diversity and inclusion programs at state institutions has already caused at least one DEI office to shut down as others are working with legal teams to figure out what to do next, reports AL.com's Rebecca Griesbach. Jacksonville State University will close its Office of Diversity and Inclusion on May 31st. Last spring, JSU reported $152,830 in spending on salaries for a director and an administrative assistant for that office, and school documents show it supported four students on work-study programs. The university did say that no staff would be cut. Hey, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll play excerpts from yesterday's child care virtual event with Senator Katie Britt. Glad to have y'all back. Okay, child care in America and Alabama. Many people say it's too hard to get, and when you get it, it costs way too much. There was a virtual event yesterday in which journalists, including Trisha Powell Crane of AL.com's Alabama Education Lab, asked questions of two U.S. senators and a foundation CEO. Now, I'm going to play an edited sampling from that event. You'll hear Senator Patty Murray a Washington Democrat, and Senator Katie Britt, an Alabama Republican, 
talk a little about the problems that exist and some differences when it comes to getting something passed on Capitol Hill, and then Britt will address a question about where the sides might find common ground. Asking the questions are Daniel Beekman of the Seattle Times and Tricia, who many of you have heard on this show before. Uh, first, we wanted to ask you, how did we get to this point where it's so hard for so many parents to find and pay for child care in states across our country? We'll start with Senator Britt, and then we'll ask Senator Murray the same question. Senator Britt? Um, well, I want to start by thanking um, Senator Murray for her leadership. So she uh, started this conversation when no one was talking about it. And because she started it, I don't have to start it. I get to join it. I was in this situation, you know, about 14 years ago, looking for child care. The cost of it was astronomical then. You know, I, I think about how much we were paying to send our two kids to, to daycare uh, there in Tuscaloosa and then Birmingham and um, how challenging it would have been to make ends meet um, had we not had a nest egg set aside. And so you think about all of those people who are working diligently to, to make it work. And you think about, um, you know, for those parents who have the opportunity to stay home and wanna do that, that is incredible. But for those men and women who want to enter our workforce, we wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to do that. And so whether it is cost or availability. It seems like we are failing um, on both sides. So Alabama, as you well know, is a more rural state. And I know that we have essentially uh, rural child care deserts um, scattered all around Alabama, even in our urban areas, as you heard me allude to from my own personal experience, the cost is just unsustainable. And so how we got here is likely because there were not enough women like Patty Worry or myself at the table being able to speak directly into this, bringing it to light and um, showing the nation that it's certainly something that we have to solve. And so I look forward to continuing to be a part of the conversation. I'm clearly new here and have been here about 16 months, I know that there's a lot to learn. But when I think about experiences like my own or like my family members, um, or the constituents whose stories I hear, um, I know that doing nothing is not an option. And so we've got to figure out there and how to do something, how to do something and certainly how to do it together. Thanks for that. Uh, Senator Murray, how did we get here to this point? It's such a good question. Thank you. And it's great to be on with my friend, Senator Britt, who's on my committee and a, a great partner to work with on many issues. How did we get here? Because our nation has never seriously taken the issue of child care as an inc uh, incredibly important foundation to our economy. So it has been a silent problem for many, many years. Parents just struggled with it. They either didn't take a job or they left the job market or they had childcare that wasn't safe. They didn't want to complain about it because if they complained, it would they were worried that their boss wouldn't hire them or promote them because childcare was a problem for them. So it was really just a silent issue and one that our country never took seriously. You know, in, in this country, we know that we have to invest in the infrastructure of roads and bridges and highways. They're critical to our economy working. We have to look at child care as the same thing, because if people don't have the ability to know their child is in a safe place where they are secure, they can't do a good job at work or they're not working. That hurts our economy, it hurts our families individually, it hurts our communities. I believe that how we get out of this is by our country finally taking seriously childcare as a basic infrastructure investment for our country, for all of us. Uh, Senator Murray, I believe you've introduced the Child Care for Working Families Act every year since 2017. Uh, what's your case for how that would help families and why hasn't it passed? So my legislation actually provides grants to communities to actually build the facilities so you have a place where kids can go. Secondly, so what our legislation does is cap out-of-pocket costs for families at 7% so that it becomes affordable. That means more kids will be in our, our child care centers, and it means that we will have uh, more income for those child care senators, senators, centers to stay open. And finally, we address the issue of pay. Senator Britt, uh, you know, I believe there hasn't been Republican support for the proposal that Senator Murray was talking about. Uh, could you speak to why that is uh, and or what would be better from your perspective than the solution that she's proposing? With other yeah. Democrats. I would say um, 
a, a couple of things when you look at it. I would love to take a look at the piece of legislation and really kind of sort of dig in and and, and wrap my head around it and figure out, you know, where um, where our um, different thoughts overlap and, and kind of sort of where I have questions. One of the things I'm always concerned about when it does come to spending. So when it comes to spending and you look at that, you look at the 7% and how you offset that, you know, having yet another industry that is waiting on Congress to do its job when we haven't actually passed all 12 bills on time, when we're talking about a discretionary standpoint uh, since 1997. And the last time we actually passed them individually was 1995. You know, I hesitate to, to tie anything to that. Then when you look at mandatory spending, um, as you all know, that has continued to grow in this nation. We're $34.5 trillion in debt. And when we kind of look at that and look at how not only that's fiscally irresponsible, but morally, morally irresponsible to put on the back of, of these kids. It's like, how do we figure out how to not add to what is now 73% of mandatory spending that we have in this country? So I think probably having not looked at it, my initial thought is, you know, what is what? how do we make this um, work? How are we judicious in it? How are we targeted in the funding and make sure the dollars go to the right place? But I certainly know that all of the things that she just talked about um, are are critical. I'd say also making sure that, you know, small businesses, you know, we, we're, we're thoughtful about how these kinds of things impact them. Um, just wanted to ask Senator Murray if, if she wanted to respond on the spending question at all. Yeah, Dan, I mean, I think what I heard Katie saying is it's a great idea, but it's going to cost us something. Yeah, we, and when you invest in infrastructure, it does cost something. But I think what we have to, how we have to look at the childcare crisis is it, according to actually a, a Ready Nation report, um, the lack of childcare cost $122 billion in lost earnings, productivity, and revenue each year. Um, this is one of my favorite questions. I always like to find common ground. Um, Senator Brett, starting with you, where do you think you can find common ground with Democrats on child care? Um, I, I think there's actually probably a, a lot of places, to be honest with you. And Trish, I just want to tell you, I thank you for that question, because it is my belief that um, where we share a common goal even if we have different ideas about how we achieve that goal, um, it is encumbered upon us as elected leaders to sit in a room and figure out a pathway forward. And too often, I believe the media focuses on the places where we don't agree versus trying to find the places. And 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 by media, I mean media, social media, people, all, all of the above. Um, find the places where we um, where we do and figure out how to move those forward. Um, Senator Murray probably has a better idea of the different touch points, but I think the things that um, she has worked on, obviously, with Head Start and working on making sure that that's there, I think taking a look probably at where the poverty level is and the drop off from the poverty level to um, to assistance to non assistance, um, you know, that is obviously not sustainable. If, if you just look at that that number, um, somebody making, you know, 25,000, you know, whatever it is, $800 a, a month um, to someone who's just making $200 more than that at 26 thousand dollars a year, excuse me, not a month, but a year. Um, I think there's probably common ground, obviously, there. And how do we figure out how to help um, low income individuals get there? Um, I think, obviously, rural communities and making sure that we support, um, incentivize and, uh, the opening of child care facilities in more rural communities, I think, is something we certainly come together on. Um, finding ways is, finding ways to, to figure out how to drive up wages and incentivize people into a career path path. Um, and obviously such an important one, forming young minds and um, being an educator, whether it is a caretaker from the beginning or an educator later in life is so critically important to the next generation um, and, and figuring out how to make that be sustainable. Um, so I'm, I am confident that there are many places when it comes to affordability and accessibility where we overlap. And I am committed to where those places are to figuring out how to move them forward and where we have different opinions, sitting down and understanding the different perspective um, so that we can see if we can navigate through that to ultimately achieve what we need to, which is a better child care community, better opportunities, um, more resources um, for people who want to reenter the workforce. I look at a place like Alabama, and Trish, you know this, our labor participation rate 
is not where it needs to be. You know, it's what, 57.5% or something right around there. It's five points lower than the national average. And if if child care, to Senator Murray's earlier point, is an impediment to people entering the workforce, we need to remove that impediment. So I feel good about being able to find common ground in many spaces in this area. Hey, folks, there's a whole lot more on this conversation on the AL.com YouTube page and on the AL.com Facebook page under videos. Thank y'all so much for listening. We're going to be back here again tomorrow. Until then, y'all come by and see what we're up to on the Internet at AL.com.